Found the safe. The sacred is a very popular water in case anybody doesn't know. Vineyard the sacred. Yes, he gets 10, 12, 15,000 hits whenever he puts something out. Yeah. People get 198 comments in six hours. Okay, this right. is from this is from the sacred. I'm only I'm partly reading this for atmospherics. It's called emergency warning from the sacred. Okay. Uh, dear friends. I have learned that several anti-empire websites have been hit by strong and sustained DDoS attacks. Distributed denial huh? of service. Yeah. What's it called? Distributed denial of service. Right. Yeah. Including Craig Murray. Craig Murray was a former UK ambassador to Uzbekistan, I think it was, who exposed the, some of the stuff that was going on. And apparently, the Russian journal, New Eastern Outlook, which was knocked off line by a big hacking attack and is still down Saturday. They have been attacked multiple times the past two months and then a final attack succeeded in shutting them down. They are trying to, to get it back off. We might be next. Okay. So this is this is I've never seen this anything posted like that before on the sacred. And I go to it. Not all the time, but you know, a good chunk of the time. So I wanted, I wanted to say that that we are living, uh, we are entering the hot phase of the battle between two paradigms. And when he means anti-empire, he means his idea of an empire, which he calls Zionist or whatever. But it's it's the same empire we're talking about. It's 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 just he has a different name for it. We call it the British Empire, he calls it the uh, Anglo-Zionist Empire or something else like that, but it's the same empire. Now, I'm going to go through four basic aspects of the situation. The first, I think is important, um, is the resonance of this particular moment in history to the moment 35 years ago, on March 23rd, 1983, when Ronald Reagan adopted LaRouche's policy in, 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 in a speech. What should have happened then, after, had this policy been carried through, and did it, has the potential of finally happening now. The second thing I'm going to cover is the emergence of the evidence, despite all the, the assaults, of a growing dialogue between Russia, China, and the U.S. This appears to be connected to recent personnel changes in the Trump administration. The third connected to this uh, growing dialogue is that the British in their own name have had to come into the open to get the war going with Russia and China. It's very serious, but they are now exposing themselves. And last is some of the reflections and hypotheses on the battle going on that we cannot, know, that we can barely see, if not, if not at all see, or must assume is going on and reflected in Canada, in both the institutions and in the, the battle that's going on also within the diaspora of nationalities who feed back into their, into their native countries. Because there is, there is a lot there. So, I'm going to start with the reflections from from 1983, and I'll start with uh, um, uh, I gotta find this reference here. I'm sorry about this. Okay. Okay, the 
first part is, um, is two tweets by Trump, which I think are important. The first tweet is, I call President Putin of Russia to congratulate him on his election victory. In the past, Obama called him also. The fake news media is crazed because they wanted me to excoriate him. They are wrong. Getting along with Russia and others is a good thing, not a bad thing. So that's one tweet. The second tweet is, they can help solve problems with North Korea, Syria, Ukraine, ISIS, Iran, and even the coming arms race. Bush tried to get along but didn't have the smarts. Obama and Clinton tried but didn't have the energy or chemistry. Peace through strength, he concludes. Now, peace through strength is the, is the formulation that Ronald Reagan used in March 23rd, 1983. Peace through strength. And, and he, he characterized Bush as not having the smarts, and that's correct. And he, he characterized Obama and Clinton tried didn't have the energy or the chemistry. Well, I don't know about Obama, but Clinton didn't pursue it all the way. Clinton was in that direction and didn't pursue it. Now, so now this quotation, peace through strength, is, uh, is, um, is, is, uh, is a key, is a key word that, is a key concept that, that he's using, which is also the, the same thing that Ronald Reagan did back then. Okay, so, uh, so I'm now going to go to Lynn. Okay. Now this is LaRouche's description of this period when he was running for president in 2008, which I believe was the last time he ran for president. No. And, and this is a video. I have been organizing the strategic defense operation, including initially from 1977, long before it was called the SDI. I was the one who said, we're going to make a project out of this thing. So I adopted this and, and stated this in, as my program in 1979, when I was running as a presidential candidate. Follow up after he was, then I had, this conversation with Reagan, and then as a follow-up, after he was president, we had a follow-up with various people in the Reagan circles, including his National Security Council. I was working with the head of the National Security Council on this operation, and with people from the CIA and this and that. I was sworn to this and sworn to that, so I was doing the whole thing. The SDI was my work, which they liked, and there was a faction, including the president, who liked it. He liked it because he was against he always hated Henry Kissinger. And he hated Henry Kissinger particularly because of the so-called revenge weapons. The idea that you could build super weapons and if somebody throws a bomb at you, you obliterate the planet. That is not considered a good defense and he was against that. When he saw from experts that what I was saying was accepted, uh, was saying was uh, accepted expert, military and others, and this was French intelligence, the leadership of the Gauls faction in France. This was the leadership of the German military. This was the leadership of the Italian uh, military and all over the world. I was the creator of the SDI. Reagan liked it, adopted it. I was cre creating the thing in direct cooperation during the entire period with the cooperation of the National Security Council and the heads of the CIA. People recognized that I was right. I had scientifically cap capability and knowledge to do it. Now I'm going to read you parts of, of, of that part of the speech that uh, Ronald Reagan did. And uh, uh, my fellow Americans, etc. The subject I want to discuss with you, peace and national security, is both timely and important. Timely because I've reached a decision which offers a new hope for our children in the 21st century. The defense policy of the United States is based on a simple premise. The United States does not start fights. We never, we will never be the aggressor. We maintain our strength in order to deter and defend against aggression. That's an entirely different concept of defense that developed, that emerged around PNAC 
Project for a New American Century, and the new doctrine of left prompt global strike. Entirely different. Okay. We maintain our strength in order to deter and defend. Since the dawn of the atomic age, we sought to reduce the risk of war by maintaining a strong deterrent and seeking genuine arms control. Deterrence means simply this, making an adversary, any adversary who thinks about attacking the United States and our allies or our vital interests concludes that the risk to him outweigh any potential gains. Once he understands that, he won't attack. We maintain the peace to our strength. Weakness only invites aggression. This is exactly the it's exactly what Putin has done. It's exactly what Reagan is saying here. No different. This strategy of deterrence has not changed. It still works. Okay. But what, make, what it takes to maintain deterrence has changed. It took one kind of military force to deter an attack when we had a far more nuclear weapons than any other power. It takes another kind now that the Soviets, for example, have enough accurate and powerful nuclear weapons to destroy virtually all of our missiles on the ground. Now this is not to say that the Soviet Union is planning to make war on us. No. I, I do not believe a war is inevitable. Quite to the contrary. But what we must recognize is that our security is based on being prepared to meet all threats. There was a time when we depended on coastal forts and artillery batteries. Because with the weaponry of that day, any attack would have come from the sea. Well, this is a different world, and our defense must be based on, on recognition and awareness of the weapons we possess. Now, so far tonight, I've shared with you my thoughts on the problems of national security we must face together. My predecessors in the Oval Office have appeared before you on other occasions to describe the threat posed by the Soviet power and have proposed steps to address that threat. But since the advent of nuclear weapons, those steps have been increasingly directed towards deterrence of aggression through the promise of retaliation. This approach to stability through offensive threat has worked. We and our allies have succeeded in preventing nuclear war for more than three decades. In recent months, however, my advisors, including in particular the Joint Chiefs of Staff, have underscored the necessity to break out of a future that relies solely on offensive retaliation for our security. And over the course of these discussions, I have more and more deeply convinced that the human spirit must be capable of rising above dealing with other nations and human beings by threatening their existence. Feeling this way, I believe we must thoroughly examine every opportunity for reducing tensions and for introducing greater stability into the strategic calculus on both sides. Wouldn't it be better to save lives than to avenge them? And he goes on. So he calls for... Uh, the development of new weapons of uh, defensive weapons based on new principles that would that would knock out the missiles and that this be done in joint collaboration with the Soviet Union <coughs> which was the LaRouche, LaRouche was proposed and which LaRouche worked out the back channel discussion between the United States and the Soviet Union on that and his idea was that the threat now that he was facing, that the Soviet Union was also facing, was that the weapons, the offensive weapons had reached such a condition and their positioning had reached such a place that, that the temptation to launch a preemptive nuclear strike existed because that such a, such a thing was, uh, could knock out the ability for retaliation. And so that was the imbalance. And that imbalance had been made much worse by the previous administration of uh, Jimmy Carter under the direction of Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was playing nuclear chicken games with the, with the Soviet Union as, as a way of, of trying to get the edge on, 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 on in other areas. So, so this is, was a scary, uh, the Carter administration was very scary in this, in this respect. And so there were, in the Carter administration and also in the establishment, there were these people that wanted to win a nuclear war or wanted to, to force uh, the Soviet Union. Now, uh, now, now, at the same time that this was going on, our movement had for, for a good seven, five, five, six years been saturating the U.S. population with the idea of, with this idea. 
And also we had a 10,000 person demonstration that was not reported in the media in Washington, D.C. on this. We brought all our networks, the civil rights movement, we brought everybody together. We had a 10,000 person march on the Capitol Hill, on the, on the, on the, the Capitol from the monument, and nobody, it wasn't covered. We were discovered that these things don't get covered if they don't want to. And uh, so uh, the offer to the, to the Soviet Union was joint development. And the idea was that if this, the Soviet Union had a, a significant advances in, in basic science that they could not realize within their existing infrastructure and, and economic, industrial economy, because they were somewhat isolated. Whereas the West could take those basic uh, discoveries and, 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 and apply them. So by ending the by bringing the U.S. and the Soviet and the Soviet Union together in the just joint development, the technological transformation potential would, would escalate. Uh, and uh, the population of the United States at that time, 35 years ago, were not anti-science or were not anti-development the way they were, the way they are now. And there was a tremendous excitement among the engineering and scientific layers about this idea. And another person who was a very prominent uh, scientist in the United States was who was pushing the same policy uh, in tandem with LaRouche was Dr. Edward Teller. He was pushing the same policy with the same ideas. Um, and he also had the concept which later surfaced uh, later on about defending the planet from, from uh, being hit by asteroids. You know, that, that, that's a very real problem, and that, that's coming up now. Now, so you could have a rapid rate of technological progress by combining Soviet science, Western economic and logistical production base. And the, the industrial base of, of the United States was still quite significant. The industrial base of Europe was still quite significant relative to what it is now. Uh, had, now, this, this is the new paradigm. Okay, this is the new paradigm. Okay, what's the new paradigm? Economic development for the world. The, the U.S. and the Soviet Union work together for the benefit of the United States and the Soviet Union. And and so, so that was um, that was um, uh, that was okay. And. <coughs> to go into this next aspect. Okay. So, so, however, the Soviets rejected the offer. There had been a shift in the, in the there had been a shift in that um, end drop off had come to um, the, 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 the party chairmanship. And he didn't go for it. And he was the pro he was the, the mentor to later Gorbachev. So they didn't go for it. And uh, had the Soviets gone with Ronald Reagan on this proposal, then Reagan could have collaborated with the Soviet Union. And that would have given him the political power, strategic power, to deal with a lot of other problems internally. So because if if once the U.S. was co collaborating with the Soviets, the British would not be able to control the relationship between the, uh, the Cold War would begin to end, but more importantly, they would not be able to control that relationship. The relationship would become uh, un 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 uh, unmanaged, or um, et cetera. And that would have been the beginning then, and that would have strengthened Reagan internally to be able to do a lot of other things that he wanted to do that he never got the chance to do, shut down the drug trade, and uh, a lot of other things. Uh, and also, Ronald Reagan was not opposed to, to third world development. But he was, unfortunately, ideologically stuck in the free market mentality. But he was not opposed to third world development. He was not in that. He was more, he was more, actually, he was not opposed to it. And uh, so, so, had this collaboration gone on, we would not be living in an anti science, the anti science trends. And the green stuff would not have become as prominent as it is now. Now, 
Uh, one year later, Lyndon LaRouche proposed uh, something called, he wrote, he wrote, it was on March um, 30th, 1984. He we put this out called the LaRouche Doctrine, Draft Memorandum of Agreement between the United States and the USSR. So we actually put forward a draft memorandum of understanding between the United States and the Soviet Union. And here are some excerpts. The political foundation for durable peace must be A, the unconditional sovereignty of each and all nation states, and B, cooperation among sovereign nation states to the effect of promoting unlimited opportunities to participate in the benefits of technological progress to the mutual benefit of each and all. The most crucial feature of present implementation of such a policy of durable peace is a profound change in the monetary, economic, and political relations between dominant powers and those relatively subordinated nations often classed as developing nations. Unless the inequalities lingering in the aftermath of modern colonialism are progressively remedied, there will be no durable peace on this planet. Insofar as the United States and the Soviet Union acknowledge the progress of the productive powers of labor through the planet to be in the vital strategic interest of each and both. These two powers are bound to that degree and in that way by a common interest. This is the kernel of the political and economic policies and practice indispensable to the fostering of durable peace between the two powers. The general advancement of the productive powers of labor in all sovereign nations, all sovereign states, must emphatically so-called developing, most emphatically so-called developing nations requires a global emphasis on increasing globally the percentile of the labor force employed in scientific research and related functions of research and development, increasing the absolute and relative scales of capital goods production and also the rate of turnover in capital goods production and C, combining these two factors to accelerate technological progress in capital goods uh, outputs. Therefore, High rates of export of such capital goods output to meet the needs of developing nations are indispensable for the general development of so-called developing nations. Our common goal and our common interest is promoting both the general welfare and promoting preconditions of durable peace between uh, our two people. By supplying increased amounts of high technology capital goods to developing nations, the exporting economies foster increasing rates of turnover in their own most advanced capital goods sectors of production. The importer of such advanced capital goods increases the productive power of labor in the economy of the importing nation. This enables the importing nation to produce its, its goods at a lower average social cost and, establish, and enables it to provide better quality and cheaper goods as goods of payment to the nation's exporting capital goods. Not only are the causes of simple humanity and general peace served by such policies and practice, the arrangement is equally beneficial to exporting and importing nations. The general rate of advancement of the productive powers of labor is the most efficient is promoted by no other policy or practice. I, I find this very close to what I sense and what I see is the concept of Xi Jinping. Uh, idea of development along the Belt and Road. I see the same concept of increasing the productive powers of labor. And I'll give you an example. Um, in 2008, uh, China, by their accounts, had 200 million in poverty. Today they have 30 million. What's the difference? What happened? Well, between 2008 and now, 10 years later, 25,000 kilometers of high-speed rail have been built. And many other things that happened to the Chinese economy that increased the productive power of labor to the point that they were able to upgrade 200 million to, to, to 30 million. Now, in, in China, the only poor that exist are rural poor. They don't have poor in the cities. The cities all have people employed and earning. Uh, they don't have they don't have people on the streets. They don't have people, you know, homeless people. In the urban centers, are everyone has 
you know, things that they have to do. And, and there has been an increase in per capita household power of labor, but this could not have been done without expanding this uh, internal economy. And the high-speed rail is very important because it connects everyone. It makes it easier for people to, to, to connect. And also the development of it also had to inc include a development internally of Chinese, of Chinese industry. So I say this uh, also, what Putin, what Putin is saying now to the West, and has been saying now to the West, is sovereignty and mutual development. And it's, this is especially true in the, uh, uh, it's especially true in Putin's last speech on, on March the 1st to the Russian uh, parliament. He said, science and technological progress is the way out for the uh, Russian population. Um, stabilizing Russia so we can do that, and most importantly, sharing that with the rest of the world. And the sovereignty of every nation. The sovereignty of every nation. You know, respect for the sovereignty of every nation. He talks about rule of law as well. And the rule of law. Yeah. So this, law. this idea, this memorandum of understanding from 1984 is reflected if you combine both Putin and Xi Jinping's you know, it's, 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 re re it's reflected there. Okay, now, so now I'm going to discuss the e emergence of evidence that a dialogue is being, is, has been, been going on or starting or is emerging between Trump, Xi, and Putin. And I'll start with the fact that the Russians intervened in yet another election. They elected Putin for another six years. <laughs> <laughs> Combined with G, not having term limits, the significance of this cannot be overemphasized. This means that Putin and G don't have to second guess what their actions are going to be because of factional problems in dealing with each other or with Trump. In other words, in a crisis like this, um, you need to have decisive leadership. If there's factional problems going on and people are trying to climb, or people are playing factional politics, factional interests, which is a normal thing, it may not be that of a big of a problem in, in, in general times, although it is a problem. But in a time of crisis, you cannot have people, it's like in a war, you cannot have um, dissenting uh, colonels and, and, and majors and, and what have you. You can't have you know, like, that's why whenever a war comes, they fire most of the, the, um, the generals because they've been, they've been jockeying for position and they've been doing all this stuff, you know. So, so now, Putin is now at the helm of Russia. No one is going to undermine what he's going to do openly. And the same with Xi. And stability is key here. And the stability is key. Uh, the British operate on instability, playing factions all the time. Now, Xi has said something very profound that most people don't get, and that is he's calling the period that we're now going into for the Chinese people, he's calling it the, the New Long March. Now, that has meaning for the survivors of the Long March as well as their, their descendants. The Long March was when uh, Mao's peasant army was surrounded down in, in uh, down in here, uh, and, and they took a march up to uh, Yunnan, and it was it was over very difficult terrain, mountainous terrain, uh, canyons and rivers, and and I think. Uh, <laughs> They lost 75% of the people on the way. And once they got up to the caves, and they were uh, uh, away from them, because what, what, what um, Chiang Kai-shek had done, he, had, he, had, he was surrounding this whole area and was going was to squeeze them to death. And so they did this long march. And, 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 um, and I'm just saying that, as a, as a metaphor, what, this, what, what, what she is saying to his people is, look, we're, we're, you know, we're coming up, but it's not going to be nice. 
So why is it not going to be nice that we're coming up in the world? Because it's a march for full industrialization and global development in the shadow of a of nuclear war and financial collapse. It's in the shadow of nuclear war and financial collapse. That's why it's the long march. It's not, it's not, it's, it's not easy. It's not an easy thing. And he's being he's being very clear about that in a metaphorical way. And, and only this kind of march can get past the collapse and the financial collapse and the nuclear war possibilities. Now, neither Putin nor Xi are naive about the situation. It is also clear they see in Trump someone who might, who while he might lack depth in certain areas, but one who they can work with. It is also the case that the empire sees the same thing, that they're afraid that Trump will work with them, just like Ronald Reagan would have worked with the Soviet Union. Even though Ronald Reagan presented a very tough, you know, piece to strength, he was willing to work with the, the, the Soviet Union. And his, his message was not, we're going to launch a preemptive nuclear war to win, win, you know, win it. Now, now, we notice that Trump keeps calling Xi a great human being and a friend, and they have a direct relationship. And the evidence of Trump and Putin is not fully clear, but there seems to be what happened in the recent period. And I'm going to go through an a, a, a narrative which may have, I may not get it right, but I'm just going to go through this. The British Skripal affair was to coincide with a false flag chemical attack in Buddha by Damascus and the hysteria plus the inconvertible evidence presented to Trump was to start was to get Trump to start bombing Syria. It appears that Tillerson of the State Department was in on this uh, business. At a certain point, General Gerasimov, the head of Russian uh, armed forces, got a hold of Dunford, the head of U.S. armed forces, uh, uh, the head of Joint Chiefs, and got and on this, and the military got to Trump. Now, mind you, okay, I'll get into it. And he had Pompeo check out, uh, at the CIA check out uh, on the uh, false flag situation potential. And, and, and that led to the firing of Tillerson and Pompeo coming into the State Department. Uh, then there was a leak that Trump's advisors had emphatically told Trump not to call Putin. And we're talking about McMaster and the National Security Agency. Uh, uh, National Security. And Trump, now McMaster and Trump have not been on the same page for, on this for some time. And, uh, from the beginning. And McMaster uh, went just like that. After and a leak. Huh? Uh, right after that, someone in uh, McMaster's office leaked out the memo that said, do not. It was yeah. capital letters, do not congratulate Putin. Yeah. He, it was leaked by his office, yeah. which is reason for fire. So, yeah. so a key aspect of both Tillerson and McMaster's uh, uh, leaving would have been the confirmation by the U.S. military of Russia's new weapon capabilities, <coughs> ending the fantasies of the types like McMaster and others winning the nuclear war. So in other words, we, we moved into a different phase, phase space after that speech and the confirmation to Trump of what the Russians have had. Also, we discovered in a number of weeks ago that the, the three heads of Russian intelligence um, who are under sanctions came to the United States secretly to meet with the three, the three American counterparts, which included Pompeo and CIA. And I think it included the NSA and one other person. Um, Head of, I think it was, and that they, and that since, and that either before or since then, a channel of discussion has been going on between the CIA under Pompeo and the Russian uh, equivalent FSB. Now, if this is true, it is bypassing the British control of the channels of communication whereby Trump is fed disinformation that are run by the British and the U.S. establishment that is locked into the doomed British system of too big to fail and too big to jail. Now, this has created a situation where, uh, which has forced the British in their own name to now go into a drive to force the United States into war, and if not start one themselves, 
And the British are now escalating the conflict with Russia in their own name. Uh, I should mention that there that one one key political leader that's not going along with this <coughs> is that of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn. And I suspect that if they don't get their way, he will become the next Prime Minister of Great Britain. <coughs> now, the EU heads of state meeting was just convened uh, uh, by uh, Theresa May. You know, the U.S. is leaving the, I mean, the, uh, Britain is leaving the EU, uh, EU, but still they can convene this meeting. And they, Theresa May claimed new evidence and managed to get a unanimous declaration against Russia for attacking Britain. No joint action has yet been announced. However, CNN, who, who we don't necessarily believe whenever they say something, is reporting that five to ten European nations are planning to expel diplomats. Russian diplomats. So when G says the long march, this is the long march past the shadow of death that we're, that we're looking at, the financial collapse of nuclear war. Now something very, uh, something that has yet to be fully um, the fallout is that Julia Assange, Julian Assange of WikiLeaks has issued 12 tweets on British interference in the U.S. elections uh, connecting uh, British asset misfund uh, to the FISA warrant and Papadopoulos and some other woman who is in the middle of this whole thing. So he's actually exposing the British role in, in involvement. So this brings me to what is British intelligence and how do they work? And I think this is an important issue that is not understood. There is the official structure of MI6. That's the official structure. Okay, when you retire from MI6, you get to set up your own private, private intelligence organization. Okay, and that, there's, far more private intelligence organizations connected to MI6 than there is people running, working for MI6. It's much bigger. And, uh, and uh, Christopher Steele did exactly that. He set up his own intelligence agency called Orbis. And uh, it can function privately. So it, 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 has, it can say it has no relationship to the government, or it can say it does have a relationship to the government. And then there is the intelligence connections of the financial. So all the big financial uh, entities involved in Wall Street and the city of London, the large banks like Hong Kong, Shanghai Bank, and all that stuff, they have their own people that they recruit from the CIA or the, uh, or the MI6 or whatever when they retire, and they're, and they're integrated with so you have the financial, the private intelligence, and so forth. All there, it's all one integrated. And then they have integration. They have they have essentially networks inside through the private aspect. They have networks in every country and so on and so forth. And they run they run this the system. And so we began to see an aspect of this in revelations around Christopher Steele. So Christopher Steele, who founded Orbis, which included some of his colleagues who also retired from MI6, like Pablo Miller, who recruited Colonel uh, Scripple, is alleged, Orbis is alleged to have grossed over $200 million in client fees. A private firm, $200 million in, uh, in, 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 in client fees. Much of this money comes from Russian oligarchs centered in London and reaching into Russia and the Russian diaspora. Then, this then is integrated into providing intelligence to the FBI Eastern European Crime Task Force to Victoria Nuland during the whole Ukraine situation. She got 100 memos from, from Christopher Steele directly, which uh, comes out of, just came out of the Nunez uh, investigation. That, the 100 memos was mentioned in the Nunez investigation? Yeah. No, Weiner, the guy that they fingered, mentioned 100 memos. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then he got then to the candidates and to the CIA, and most of all to John McCain, who was the Lawrence of the Jihads. <laughs> into the and so forth. Lawrence, <laughs> Lawrence of the Jihads. That covers it perfectly. 
It all connects private-public partnerships, intelligence partnerships, deeply penetrating nations. Then, the, the next set of revelations, which were att attempted to be used against Trump, involve something called Cam Cambridge Analytics, which is an extension or created by the British Psychological Profile Agency called Strategic Communications Laboratory. This is the British intervening into elections all over the world using uh, data mining to construct personality profiles of, of entire populations. Now, they stuck Cambridge Analytics onto the Trump campaign through uh, a hedge fund uh, a group called Renaissance, uh, headed by the Mercers. And they were the ones doing the job for T Ted Cruz. And they came in after Ted Cruz uh, gave up into the Trump campaign with Bannon on, who's on, with Steve Bannon on, on the board of Cambridge Analytics. And what did Bannon do once he was in? He ran ops against Trump to derail his China policy. Using, uh, so he, and what was he doing? He was using the profiles that Cambridge Analytics had developed to, to profile the population's anti-China mentality. So he was on a China bashing campaign. And last you have the House Intelligence Committee findings uh, uh, are being now scrutinized for security reasons and they will soon be released and it's expected to be a bombshell. Their findings. Not, this, is not, this is not, Russia did not collude, I mean, Trump did not collude with Russia. This, is much, this goes much further. Their findings, which is quite significant. Now, we are at the edge of consolidation of an unmediated relationship of the great powers. An unmediated, unmediated relationship between the United States, China, and Russia. And this is the first time we will have had such an unmediated relationship since Franklin Delano Roosevelt's death. The British have been mediating all these relationships through stage incidences in every kind of a penetration operation will happen. We have not had, we had the potential of an unmediated relationship under Ronald Reagan. We had a potential, even under Nixon, we had a potential with Bill Clinton to have an unmediated related relationship. In fact, part of what Bill Clinton, uh, the reason that Bill Clinton uh, helped get LaRouche out of prison and get him on uh, parole was so that he could go to Russia because he, Clinton was trying to establish an unmediated, unmediated relationship with forces in Russia that were and this is this is this is the big problem. What about Kennedy Khrushchev? Huh? Kennedy Khrushchev. Was, was that an Kennedy Khrushchev. Khrushchev. Kennedy. Um, Kennedy. That was never that never materialized because Kennedy was 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 killed. But really, the British weren't in, in that. Well, no, the British set up the Cuban Missile Crisis. Bertrand Russell played a key role. But once the missile crisis was was um calmed down in 62, that Kennedy was offering the same policy in the form of a joint uh, Soviet-U.S. space program. That was what he, just before he died, he was proposing a joint U.S.-Soviet space program. So that, that, was the, the, that was the door for, for the beginning of an unmediated relationship. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's, that's very important. Now, the British connection with the Kennedy assassination is primarily what to the CIA or the FBI? Uh, the, the, the story that we have is very simple. Permanent. Mortimer Bloomfield. And it's pretty much what was in the JFK movie. Um, who was the guy that was on trial? Clayton oh, uh, Shaw. Clayton Shaw. Clayton Shaw. Clayton Shaw. Clay Shaw. Clay Shaw. Clay Shaw. Clay. Clay, yeah. <laughs> Like now he was set, he was British. He was part of of, 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 of Prince Phillips One Thousand Club. He was sent in in the in the late thirties to build a um, to build Division Five of the FBI, which is modeled on, on, on MI Five. So he so he was head of permanent industrial uh, expositions, which was uh, also involved in attempts to assassinate De Gaulle. So they were trying to kill De Gaulle and Kennedy at the same time. And according to the
the people that we, we've been told that they, they used, uh, they used uh, people from OAS uh, that were, would have been involved in trying to kill the golf because of Algerian independence. Uh, they would have used, they used those guys at, 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 on, the, on, you know, to shoot to do the rifle. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't use Mossad. Huh? They didn't, they didn't use Mossad like this. No, no, that would be too... They needed to go much further outside. But it was one operation. The, the, the OAS and the... And, 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 and the so, tell me what OAS stands for again? Uh, organi uh, the Secret Army Organization. The Secret Army Organization of, of Pied Noirs, which were the Algerian French. Right, okay. And the, and the dissident generals. Yeah, dissident generals. So I'm going to stop there on that and, and now go into the final aspect. Uh, below the surface, I am of the view that Canada is now and is going through, through a crisis as well related to all of this. Okay? And this is not just at the federal level, but it is also at the province by province, as the economy of each province has various relations to the various regional economies in the U.S. So you have a crisis now emerging in in uh, in in Canada, okay, and this is why we must give Canada an integrated vision of a future in the new paradigm, because they, they sorely need it at this at this point in time, uh, because uh, because one of the problems is that Canada is caught between the United States and the British Empire. And whatever friction develops between British, Britain, the British Empire, and the United States is going to be reflected inside Canada. Because Canada, uh, its economy not only is dependent on the United States, and so is the economy of the United States dependent on Canada. But you can't have these two parties uh, go to war with each other without affecting the, the internal situation in Canada. So that's an important, one important feature of this. So our policy is to not is to provide Canada with a bigger picture, a bigger idea of what Canada can do. Uh, now, uh, there are two... Now, historically, uh, the British system has used foreign diasporas as recruiting grounds for operations to be run against the nations of the diaspora. This is a common theme in, in the British system, you know, you, you have refugees, they go, well, you have people go, go to the diaspora, and then they get organized as a, as a base of operations outside the reach of the, of the, of the various countries. So in other words, take a, an example um, uh, in the 90s. Where did most of the Islamic jihadi elements get cultivated? They got cultivated in Great Britain. Why? Because they're outside the reach of the nations that are that would be targeted by those jihadis. Okay. So that's a very important feature of how so so when you do terrorism, you need safe house. And safe house is best safe houses in another country where you can't you can't uh, um, reach them. Seek, uh, seek I'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so back in the day uh, when Indira Gandhi was the leader of the um, um, the non-aligned movement, and during the period she was in dialogue with Lyndon LaRouche personally, and Helga Zepp LaRouche, and she was trying to adopt the policies that LaRouche was proposing, um, the, there was this uh, Sikh separatist movement that took over the, 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 the temple there, the uh, religious Sorry, temple. temple yeah. And um, that movement, according to the Indian Indians, intelligence or Indian government was not created in India but was created in Canada and Great Britain. That's their view. Okay. And it was at, it, it was it, and this uh, this thing then Indira Gandhi did the very brutal cleaning out of the temp of the holy place and then that triggered the, her assassination and and they triggered a reprisal, and, and so forth and so on. The loss of Indira Gandhi in this situation was not a very good thing. And then later, her, her son was killed by the, uh, um, by the Sri Lankan, the Tamil Tigers. 
I believe. I'm not sure about yeah. that. Yes, yeah. that's yeah. correct. So that's another one. And that's another one, a similar one. Okay. Now, of course, this was all. Then you had the air uh, in the abomin, uh, uh, and so all of that, and, and you know all of that. But that, but that's not what I want to focus on. I want to focus on. But well, before I get to that, I'm going to do another one before I get to that, before I get to that one. And that is another example, which is very prominent, is very current, and very critical, is the Ukrainian diaspora of the post-war period, which is created, uh, which has been Nazified, and Christina Nuland represents that, and she is the minister of everything, she is the foreign minister, and she is, was directly involved in the coup in Ukraine, directly involved with Nick Victoria Nuland. And she is now the foreign minister of Canada. So this That's is Christina Freeland, this, not Newland. Oh uh, yeah, Christina Freeland. I'm sorry. <laughs> what a combination! Like whoa, Christina Freeland. I'll never forgive me for that. <laughs> okay, and uh, so this is the and then she has all the deep state connections and Soros connections and so forth, and financial connections with the banking community and so forth. But. She has also triggered the potential blowback from within Canada of a traditional Canadian policy approach that led to Canada not supporting, for instance, the Iraq War or the weapons of mass destruction business. And that was under Chrétien, but it wasn't just Chrétien. It was a faction of Canadian establishment which doesn't buy, it doesn't really go with the neocons. They don't really go with the neocons, and they're still here. And I think, I think we are, uh, our pamphlet is designed to intersect this layer to give them a vision because they, they're stuck between uh, Trump and and uh, Christina Newland. Freeland. Christina Freeland. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Christina Freeland. Uh, Hysteria freehand. You know, and, 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 and of course the trade the trade situation with, with between Canada and the United States, which is very critical to, the, to both countries, is now in all in, is all in all kinds of confusion because of the NAFTA. Uh, the fact that we're leaving NAFTA now. So I'll get back to the to the to the current situation. Um, there was a huge scandal, which everyone knows about, about the um, this guy who was uh, involved in an attempted assassination of a, a minister from the Punjab in Victoria, uh, Atwal, and it appears he got off pretty easy, um, and. Um, and then he was, he was uh, allegedly at a, he was at a reception where he got a picture taken with, with Sophia uh, Trudeau. And this became a big scandal. Okay. And then the second scandal is that there are claims that, um, what's his name? Mm -hmm. Andrew, 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 Andrew Singh. Huh? Harjit Singh. No, the other guy. Harjit Singh as well. Uh, Jadmeet, Jadmeet. Jad, yeah. Oh, Jadmeet. Yeah, yeah, Jadmeet Singh yeah, yeah. are both yeah. either either sympathetic yeah, yeah. or connected to or whatever the to, to, to the same network. Yeah. To the same network. Yeah. Now, I, I, I can't imagine Canadians elected him as an MDP leader. Well, I'll get to that. He's a separatist. Yeah. Right, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm saying, so why, why, why is he there? Yes. Why is he there? Well, what's going on? Well, Modi is not a neoliberal. He's a Hindu. And they want to portray Modi as a Hindu fascist. And they want to create uh, strife within, within India, as my view. And the two, the two avenues are he's a Hindu fascist and, and, uh, and the Muslims should go after him. And the second one is the leftists, the socialists, and the communists, which, which is a big communist movement in socialist communist movement in India is to go after him. And they to use whatever reasons, castes or whatever. Now we all know that there are there are issues that you can play in that situation. But what's the real issue is that if Modi is if India is going to make it in this period, they need a, they need to have an ability to function with a, with a leadership that has a direction towards economic development. And this is the whole question. Now, Indian politics is very complicated. I have no intention of, of, of getting into it at all. But except to... It's as good as American huh? It's as good as American <laughs> <laughs> Okay. But, 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 my hypothesis is that they're merging the remnants of, of the Sikh 
emotional seek, uh, separate aspect with the left here, and they're bringing them together because the NDP has been the left. So they're bringing the whole Sikh thing into the left and the whole left thing into the Sikh, but not in the sense of a Sikh separatist uh, operation, but more, uh, I believe, as an anti-Modi operation. And on the other hand, Modi has a lot of support in the Indian diaspora in the United States, Canada, and Great Britain. So now you have a conflict within the diaspora between, uh, between the two. Can I just add something, Paul? Yeah. It's two, it's, it does two things. It also destroys the NDP's ability to win a federal election if you can say that they've aligned themselves with, with radical Sikh um, elements and are using that as a, as a, a, right. a vote getter. You know, I mean, it's like the Canadian population at large will not vote for that. They won't. They, on that reason alone, they wouldn't vote for them. Yeah. So they're, so they're, so they're dead in the water. Yeah, exactly. At the, at the federal level. At the federal level, I'm talking, yes. Yeah, at the well, federal level. Yeah. The NDP, you know the inside of the NDP, you, you knew at that time, because I was in it, that the NDP was right for hijack. The hijack? Yeah. yeah. That's a call at the hijack. federal level. It was easy to hijack. Okay. Yeah. yeah at the federal level. All right. So, Paul, Modi uh, not just uh, has a good following in uh, at the Americas and the, and, the, and the Europe, but he's also respected, even in the Middle East. Middle East. Yeah. yeah, I believe it. I believe that too, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Because if he is not what these people try to portray. No, he's right. not. So 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 we're looking at how this how to actually deal with the internal crisis of Canada and how to how to move and use that crisis to promote the new paradigm. So that's that's our that's what we're trying to do. So I'm I'm gonna stop there and open it up. Um, oh,